Uh, thank you. Can, is this working? Okay. Thank you very much, Jim. I appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Antoniono is my uncle, and he asked me to be here, and uh, I'm very happy to be here today to give this presentation. I'd li also like to um, thank the Westmoreland County Bar Association and everyone who's uh, responsible for this terrific event. So um, we're all trained a little bit in how to give a speech. I'm going to open with a joke. Um, who, who do we know that does not want to pay taxes, has a suspended license, and a deep distrust of the government? I would say Republicans. <laughs> who is someone who wants free stuff, believes they should not be prosecuted for possession of drugs, and has a deep distrust of the police? I would say Democrats. Who combines all six of these traits? Sovereign citizens, okay? And that is the topic of my CLE today. First, let me do, uh, let, let me ask another question. Who in this room has encountered sovereign citizens before? Okay, that's a lot more hands than I thought, but maybe that should be expected. I, I think especially in criminal defense or if you're a prosecutor uh, and if you're a judge, you're going to run into them. Maybe a little bit less in civil litigation, though they do get involved in that as well. And uh, I, will, I will teach you a little bit about that today. So I wanted to start, for those of you who are not familiar, I wanted to show a, a, a clip. I'm going to show about three or four minutes of this video. It's an exchange between a judge in uh, Broward County, Florida. Uh, they record all of their bond court proceedings, which I think is interesting, and, and a sovereign citizen. And this will just give you a flavor of who these people are and the kind of things that they do in court. So, Joe, if you could start the video. Yeah, could you just go to the... Oh, sure. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that one. That one. Uh, I can't see it. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, bro. <laughs> That's okay. Sorry. Thank you. I'll cue that up for you. It'll take a second. David, David Hall. Mr. Hall has declined the services of the public defender, Your Honor. Mr. Hall, DUI, expired. Hall, um, so would you like, you wanted to say something. Um, yes, may I speak, Judge? Well, don't tell me about what happened or did not happen regarding the DUI, but if you want to tell me about something. I'd like else, to go state ahead. some things. Go ahead. I'd like to state some things for the record. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Judge John Hurley, I do accept your oath of office here today for the record, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, does this court take to, does this court take judicial notice of your oath, sir? With all due respect. Let me see. I take judicial notice of my own oath. Yes, sir, I do. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Sir, today I'm appearing as the agent and settler for David Hall. Okay. Okay. Could you get Mr. Hall for me then, sir? Where is he? I go by that name, sir. My name sounds exactly like the defendant's, and I'm here to settle that matter today. So are you and David Hall one and the same person? I'm not a person. I'm an individual. David Hall is a person. Okay. I am are the agent to that David name. Are you and David Hall one and the same individual? I go by the name David Hall, sir, and okay. I'm here about that matter today. Okay. So, so you go by the name David Hall. Okay. So this is what we're going to do. Uh, the person who goes by the name of David Hall is standing in front I'm of I'm the you. individual. You're I am an individual, not a person. You're not a person. Yes, sir. David Hall is a person. I am a private individual. David Hall is a person under color of law, sir. Okay. Where's David Hall then? The person David Hall. <laughs> Exists on paper, sir. David Hall is a corporation. Okay. This action is under color of law, sir, and I do understand that. I am here in my real capacity as the private individual for that name, okay, and I'm sure. here about that matter. You're the, and private, I'm happy to in, you're the private individual, David Hall. I'm the settler, sir. You're the settler, I'm the settler. David Hall. I'm the settler to David Hall, sir. Well, are you the private happy individual, to... David Hall? Yes. Good. Okay. We got that straight. We agree on that. Okay. Now, David May Hall, I, sir? 
David, you know what, Joe? We'll cut the video I'm off here. Record right yeah. now, multiple failures to pay traffic tickets. So, it, it, raise your hand if you've seen that video before. Anybody seen that? Okay, okay. Um, that's one of probably one of the more popular videos on YouTube showing uh, sovereign citizens in action with judges. There are many videos like this, uh, especially with their interactions with law enforcement. So either in court or interactions with law enforcement, you're gonna really see uh, what they believe and what kind of stuff uh, they come at people with. Um, my favorite part about that video is that judge, he's awesome. Um, you can check that video out or contact me, I will share it with you. He, they record all of his bond court, so that in and of itself is uh, entertaining and also enlightening. I, I watch it once in a while. But I also, if you watch to the end of that video, you will see the other inmates and they, the other defendants, and they get very interested. And they're watching everything and some of them are laughing and smiling and eventually it ends, but it goes on for about 12 minutes with all that sort of nonsense. Now, this guy is probably one of the more articulate sovereign citizens that I've seen. Some of them have a, a high level of knowledge in the theory, some much lower, um, but that's why I chose that video and I wanted to give everybody a taste of what a sovereign citizen is if you're not familiar with it. Um, can we go back to the PowerPoint? Thank you, Joe. So what is a sovereign citizen? And I put up there freemen on the land because that is something that is fundamental to their belief system. They believe that, essentially, I mean in a nutshell, that the laws do not apply to them. You know, to, so the name Freeman on the land. That's also, and I've read a lot about the movement, that's what they call themselves primarily in like the United Kingdom or a lot of other British, former British Commonwealth countries. Uh, they usually don't like the term sovereign citizen because it's become derogatory now, um, but it's more used in the United States. You'll see that Freeman on the land label used in some of the other countries where the movement has spread. And then I just included in there, I do not consent. The United States is a corporation. I have the right to travel, name and badge number. These are things that they use because generally they're trying to thwart the court system, thwart a judge, uh, thwart law enforcement. They don't want the laws applying to them. Okay, the roots of the modern sovereign citizen movement. So uh, it's, it's a little bit murky and I don't think there's any like clear, you know, historical analysis here, but um, Institutions like the Southern Poverty Law Center, um, other attorneys, uh, you know, news organizations have written about sovereign citizens. And in the 1970s, there was a movement called the Posse Comitatus Movement. And the founder, his name is William P. Gale. He's considered the founder. He was a minister. And um, he sort of was the first one to maybe articulate these ideas. And uh, sort of key to it, and, and some of the ideas that are associated with William P. Gale uh, has to do with the 14th Amendment. Um, sovereign citizens as part of their uh, theory that the laws don't apply to them, probably the, the largest one, and there's many of them, goes back to the 14th Amendment, which was passed during the Reconstruction era after the Civil War. It includes equal protection, a lot of the constitutional rights that we are familiar with. Uh, Mr. Gale argued that the 14th Amendment uh, basically took away the rights of a lot of American citizens, that it was, you could view it as the as federal government overreach, right? The 14th Amendment comes into play and what his theory says is that the 14th Amendment creates a different class of citizen. They, they sometimes call them federal citizens. And then you have state citizens that remain sovereign, uh, therefore the term sovereign citizen. 
Uh, these state citizens, and this is part of what Gail's movement was at the beginning, was the idea that you could renounce your federal citizenship. You could renounce it, it's, they sometimes use the word rebirth, and once you've done this, the federal laws don't apply to you. Uh, the nonsensical thing about it, if, once you really s start to study the movement, is they also argue state laws don't apply to them, local ordinances, basically no law. Um, well, I don't want to say that. They have their own version of the law, that is the common law, but it's not necessarily the common law that we are familiar with um, as attorneys, people who work in the legal system. Okay. And let, let me give a little more history on the movement. Um, you know, started in the 1970s, some scholars have pinpointed uh, what they referred to as the farm crisis or like agricultural recession in sort of middle America really gave, uh, I guess, strength to the movement that William P. Gale started. Um, it continued into the 1980s. It's often associated with the militia movement of the 1980s. So again, rural areas, uh, you know, uh, people forming militias, they also tend to adopt some version of the sovereign citizen ideology. Um, it, it existed through the 90s. My own personal opinion is that since the 2000s and really in the last 10 years, I think the movement has gained a lot of steam. And the reason for that is the internet, social media, YouTube. Uh, it appears to me these ideas can easily be dispersed online. There's hundreds of websites from these people, maybe thousands, and there's sort of uh, sovereign citizen gurus, perhaps like Mr. Gale, they have their own YouTube channels, and you can watch hours, essentially, of this nonsense. So um, that's a little bit of uh, history on the movement and also uh, a bit of context um, for the current movement. The so Southern Poverty Law Center puts the number at 100,000 to 500,000 in the United States alone. Um, I think it's gonna be really hard to put a number on the movement because the degree of people who are like, and I'll get into this a little bit later, there's sovereign citizens who are highly dedicated like really believe this, it's you know I, I almost on par with a, a religion. And then there are people who use it out of convenience, who or only know a little bit of the ideology. So you may see someone who's pulled over by the police and they start using the sovereign citizen tactics though you know, they're not fully dedicated, like back to William P. Gale, have an entire knowledge of all of the ideas around it, um, but you will also have those people who are highly knowledgeable in the movement, probably like the individual that we saw in that video. Um, like I said, he was a little more articulate than a lot of them. And the, I put on there the common law handbook, so that is something that one of these movements sells. You can go online and buy a common law handbook and it's 95% nonsense, but it's fun. Okay, uh, seminal fake theories underlying the movement. And you see in this picture, and we'll, I'll get into more details, we already talked about the 14th Amendment. Oh, can you leave that up, Joe? Sorry. Uh, we already talked about the 14th Amendment, uh, the idea that the United States is a corporation, uh, the straw man, and then the UCC, and I'll, I'll get into more detail of that shortly. Okay. So the United States is a corporation, and I guess one thing to remember about it is the I, it, it, when looked at as a whole, it's incoherent. Okay, it's, it's incoherent. You're not going to have a nice, tight-knit uh, you know, value or belief system here. It, it, it's a combination of various different beliefs that essentially 
they adopt when it fits their situation. So one of them, the 14th Amendment, the United States is a corporation. So uh, the 14th Amendment one is very commonly used. Again, this, it's sort of like the federal government creates this new class of citizens, and you don't want to be part of it. You can renounce it. Um, another popular part of the ideology is in the 1920s with the Great Depression and the creation of the United States Federal Reserve. Many of the sovereign citizens, part of their belief is that the Federal Reserve was created by like a shadowy cabal of bankers. And when the Federal Reserve was created, this federal government was set up, it's actually a corporation. So that's something that they will argue all the time. Uh, and again, it's convenient depending on the situation. The common law, this is the law and commercial law I did not contract with you. So I, I was wrong in saying that they don't believe in any law. They do believe in some law. They have their own interpretation of the common law. And really what they argue is, you know, they go back in time and they will go back in time to say, you know, the founding of the country and they'll say, well, this law didn't exist then, or any law that was passed after the 1920s or after the 14th Amendment is invalid. But the common law that existed before, that is the law. And essentially, they will just interpret it uh, however they want. Um, straw man theory. And that's a bit of what David Hall talked about in his video, or in that video, <clears throat> the agent, the settler, and the person. So once this federal government corporation was created, the sovereigns believe what they did was they create, uh, they create a, a straw man or a paper or administrative version of each individual in the United States. So they oftentimes, uh, they deny their social security number. They deny their birth certificate. They will deny their driver's license because they believe that items like that create this paper individual. And that paper individual is who the law actually has authority or jurisdiction over in their theory. So they can say, well, that's not actually me. This is just this, uh, this straw man that the United States government corporation created, you're applying all these laws to it, they don't apply to me, I'm the freeman on the land, I'm the natural born citizen. There's all kinds of different terms that they will use. And you know, again, that helps them avoid uh, consequences under the law. Um, uh, one thing I forgot to mention, it, the, the movement also in the 1970s was largely a tax protest movement. So you really see in the 1970s and all the way up until today, um, there would be litigants who go into court, they fight the IRS, they refuse to pay taxes, and some of them were like acolytes of Mr. Gale, and then other ones just pick up on this ideology and fight the payment of taxes, and a lot of them end up in jail. Um, but that's, that straw man theory goes right in line with that. They say, I, me, the natural person, I don't uh, have to pay taxes. That paper individual that the government created, they have to pay the taxes. And what Mr. Hall, one of the things he was doing there is when they, they come into court, they believe that if, if they use certain language or they accept jurisdiction uh, in one way or another, then all of a sudden the court has power over them. But if they are coming into court as the agent and the settler for that paper name that the law is holding responsible, okay, ultimately they can't be held responsible. So it's, you know, it's all, again, there's some coherence to the theory, and then, but when you look at it all together, it's pretty much nonsense. Um, Articles of Confederation, another thing that they will run back to, and, and again, it's not coherent, and, 
and the different ones will use different theories. They'll say, well, the Constitution that was put into place, you know, in 1787, uh, that is not the Constitution of the United States. The Articles of Confederation are what actually governs because the, the Constitution was not legitimate for one reason or another. So uh, another popular argument that you will see with them. Um, Post-Civil War Reconstruction, again, I kind of touched on that. The 14th Amendment, you know, I, I don't, this movement didn't exist coherently then, but in the 1970s when it did, that's really the breaking point for a lot of them. That's when the bankers took over, um, the corporation took over. Before that, you know, the country respected the sovereignty of its citizens. Um, then we have Moorish sovereign citizens and Moorish sovereign citizen beliefs. So for the most part, I would say that the movement is, you know, loosely knit, highly spread out. Anybody can go on the internet, start reading about these things, and come up with these beliefs. Um, but there have been a few groups within the wider movement that have their own set of ideas. Um, one of the more interesting ones, and probably the largest one, though I don't have numbers on this, is the Moorish sovereign citizens. Um, it is, and I use the term later on and in the book of syncretism or syncretic because that, that basically means the blending of different ideas and or belief systems. So the, the Moorish sovereign citizens give you a little background on their history. In the early 20th century, there was a man in, I believe it was in Philadelphia. He called himself uh, the Noble Drew Ali, changed his name. And he founded this temple, it's called the Moorish Science Temple of America. Now, the Moorish Science Temple of America, and it's mostly uh, citizens of African American descent. The Moorish Sovereign Citizen Temple is a legitimate nonprofit in the United States. It's viewed as a religion uh, by the United States government, and they have officially uh, stated, you know, basically anything that these sovereign citizens do, we have nothing to do with it. Okay, so the temple's official position is. You know, these individuals who go around as part of, well, they call themselves Moors, um, and they have the sovereign citizen beliefs. It's the official uh, stance of the temple that they have nothing to do with them. But what they do is they combine these beliefs, the beliefs of the temple and the sovereign citizen movement. Their beliefs go back, again, to the founding um, Shortly after the United States was founded, they fought a short, very short war, I'm not even sure we should call it a war, with the country of Morocco in the Mediterranean Sea over shipping, trade rights, and piracy. Basically, there were pirates off the north coast of Africa that were attacking United States ships. Um, the United States government got involved, uh, I think, you know, in the... Uh, you know, all of our, the Battle of Tripoli, et cetera, United States lore stems from this. There was a battle, the Marines, et cetera. So um, they fought a short, again, I wouldn't call it a war, but the United States sent gunships over there, shelled some of the cities. There might have been a battle or two. And the United States government signed a treaty with the government of Morocco. I believe it was a kingdom at the time. This was called a treaty, the Treaty of Mutual Peace and Friendship basically said, you know, we will no longer tolerate these pirates, um, you know, with the United States, you can come through here, you can ship. Um, the Moorish sovereign citizens, they interpret that treaty entirely differently. Um, they go back to the treaty and they say that that treaty essentially gives them like diplomatic immunity, okay? They say, because of this treaty, your laws, the laws of the United States of America do not apply to me. Um, there's, other, there's another mixture in there. Some of them believe that they are descended from an ancient kingdom in, outside of Israel and that they came over to the United States prior to European settlers 
And so that also gives them a degree of immunity from the laws. Like, we were here first. You can't, you know, your laws don't apply to me. Um, and they'll mix the treaty and that theory together. Um, and they're, in a way, I would say they're one of the more organized groups. Um, and there was actually an incident fairly recently, uh, some of you may have caught it on the news, it was outside, I, think, I believe it was in Massachusetts, a group of sovereign citizen Moors, uh, there were like three carloads of them, were driving through Massachusetts and they had pulled over to put gas in their own cars. And they, they were driving out to the woods to do like military training exercises. Um, the reason they brought their own gas, again, I'll, I'll get into this a bit more, is because they did not want to do commerce in the state of Massachusetts. It's, it's another thing. If they, they believe if they're doing commerce with somebody or something, then that gives that governmental power jurisdiction over them. So when they're driving through this state, they brought their own gasoline as they drove north to go to the woods to do this training exercise. So the police saw them, state, state police saw them, pulled up to them, you know, started asking them some questions because they saw, you know, three cars and these guys out there putting gas in the car. And the state police came out and saw they were all heavily armed. They were wearing, uh, you know, military fatigues. They, had, they all had weapons. So a, a standoff ensued. Some of them ran into the woods and some of them, um, I believe, surrendered right there in the vehicles. And it was like a six to eight hour standoff. Eventually they all surrendered. No shots were fired. Nobody was hurt, um, but that group, they call themselves the Rise of the Moors, and they have a YouTube channel. And I have, you know, in writing this book and this being kind of a play hobby of mine, I've watched their YouTube channel many times. And it probably started about two years ago, and in a couple of years, it has tens of thousands of followers. And I'm sure, you know, they gain recruits that way. So that's one of the more particular uh, groups. Again, it's mostly very loose knit throughout the country, but there are some. There's one down south called the Washita Nation. They claim like Native American status. Um, so there are some organized groups. I would say the more sovereign citizens are probably one of the larger ones or the more well known. Um, thank you, Joe. Uh, international sovereign citizenship. So this, all, this goes back, to, again, to my theory that the movement is growing. I don't have official numbers. Um, but there are incidences of sovereign citizens, mostly in British, you know, English-speaking, like former British Commonwealth countries. So there's a lot of them in the United Kingdom, Scotland, Ireland, the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand but they've started to pop up in other places. So uh, during the lockdown, there was a pretty entertaining video about um, an Italian guy on a bike who had all these, and he was driving around, he was riding around during the lockdown and the police stopped him and he, you know, filed all these things in court, right? Claim all these sovereign citizen ideas in Italy. Um, you see him in Germany, uh, Northern Europe, my favorite, by far was one who was in Russia. And he had an, an encounter with the police and his argument, and it, again, it's similar, his argument was that the Soviet Union never fell. So because the Soviet Union never fell, the current Russian government did not have any authority or jurisdiction over him. Only the former Soviet Union, right? This new government was not legitimate. So you, you can see it really all over the world. So I, I touched on that in the last slide, syncretism and sovereign, citizen, sovereign citizenship. Let me get a drink of water. <clears throat> Encountering these people and talking about them can be exhausting. So um, <laughs> the... I, I touched on that, why a Moor calls the United States a corporation, because the Moors, 
you know, they borrow from the greater sovereign citizen movement. So if you watch their interactions, you know, they're only, they, it's, you know, it's not their only argument that this treaty gives them diplomatic immunity. They will also tell you that the United States is a corporation. In the 1920s, a shadowy cabal of bankers took over the government and runs everything, the 14th Amendment, et cetera, et cetera. They'll go into all the same sort of arguments. Um, and again, that, a, a, that's syncretic. Uh, you see, you see in, again, in Russia or these people in the other countries, they borrow pieces of the American and British movement and uh, you know, combine it with their own ideas. Okay, this is a fe the features of a sovereign citizen's playbook. So this is a little cartoon of a, an individual in the car, and he's saying right there, I have the right to drive without a license. And the police are saying, here we go again, get ready to break this window. Um, the right to travel. So this is probably the most common uh, thing that you will see with the sovereign citizens. I don't, it, I, well, it's taken a lot of time, my apologies. Um, I don't know how long I have. <laughs> okay, okay. I think, okay, I have until quarter after, got it. All right. So the right to travel. I am not, dra I am not driving, I am traveling. This is one of their most popular ideas. Um, many of them, and you'll, I'll talk about this more, but sovereign citizenship is also sometimes adopted out of convenience or need, right? Like if you had your license suspended for 30 years and you're still driving, you may need something to tell yourself in order to justify that activity over and over and over again. So they believe that they don't have to drive they, that they can drive without a license. And this is where it really gets into their version of the common law. Uh, they will cite opinions, Supreme Court opinions, state Supreme Court opinions from the 1890s, uh, 1910s, 1920s, basically before the automobile, which established um, a right to travel on roads and throughways um, unimpeded in certain circumstances. Um, you know, the, the Constitution does recognize a sort of right to travel. Again, I've read these opinions. Um, it has, has to do sometimes with traveling between states. Um, again, it would have to do with traveling on these old roads before automobiles. Uh, you know, once automobiles were created, states passed laws requiring people to drive with a license. They believe that those laws don't apply to them. And they will oftentimes, you know, some of them will give up fairly easily when encountered by the police. You know, the ones, the videos that make it on the internet are usually not those ones. Uh, they will resist till the end. The police will order them out of the car. They will not comply with the police, uh, and so oftentimes they have to break the window or drag them out of the car. Um, the next one, I do not consent. And so this is, this is sort of uh, a, another backbone of the movement. In their minds, nobody has authority or jurisdiction over them unless they have literally consented to it, literally. Like, Police officers, and the ones who really who deal with them really well are the ones who have a really good knowledge of the law. Um, you know, police officers will s cite traffic codes. This is the law that you're breaking, you know, 1543A. And they will say, I never consented to that. I never agreed to that. And again, that just runs through, that's like a core principle of their ideology. Uh, the next part is word games. Um, we are all attorneys, so we're pretty good at word games ourselves. Uh, they will, they will, you know, pick out little pieces of court opinions that support their opinion. Uh, we do that too. Um, 
But we understand what a holding is in a court opinion. They do not. Any sentence, anything inside of a court opinion that they can take and use, they will. Um, there are, uh, some of them have little cards that they carry with them in their car so that they can cite the little pieces of the opinion. They'll do the citation and everything. Uh, you know, the statutes, and again, they're just cherry picking. They're just cherry picking. Um, but they're really good at playing word games. And sometimes when they're dealing with police, you know, some officers get really confused and then they're just like, screw it, and they just break the window and drag them out. Um, Black's Law Dictionary, that is one of their favorite sources of law. Uh, they don't understand that it's not a source of law. They will cite it constantly in court, in in their interactions with the police, they may have it with them. Um, there's like, I can't remember what it's called now, it's in the book. There's some older law dictionary that went out of print but was used in, you know, in the early 1900s. They will cite that. Any piece of law that they can get or, or legal book that supports their opinion, they will use. But you know, those are two just important principles that run through the movement. Okay, Sovereign Citizens Toolkit, here's the individual um, in court, and you can see the attorney is like, my God, I have to deal with this, and uh, the judge really has to deal with it, so he, uh, he's got to figure out what's going on. Okay, here's just a few more things that they do. Capital letters, they believe that capital, capitalization in court documents may carry special powers, so, <laughs> words that are capitalized carry more weight. The best part about that is some federal court judge wrote an opinion on it where he basically stated, it's a, neat, it's a funny opinion to read, you know, the capitalization is done for form and function in order to, you know, make the documents easier to read or fulfill certain procedural effects. It has basically no effect in the law. They don't, the sovereign citizens don't like that. Um, name and badge number, how to properly annoy law enforcement officers. So they have m many, many tactics for this. That is one you will see almost every time. Uh, the officer will encounter them and they'll say, give me your name, give me your badge number. Usually it's best if the officer just does that because it disarms them. If the officer doesn't give it to them, it, they literally will not get off that topic. It'll just over and over. Um, but they're deflecting and they're buffering. You know, they're trying to create space and confuse the officer. It's it, it's a tool. Um, the gold fringe flag. There's actually a hilarious video on this uh, from King of the Hill, the cartoon show King of the Hill. Um, one of the characters, I can't remember, he goes into court and he, t he spits out the sovereign citizen line for the gold fringe flag. It was sort of like this little embedded bit that they did that I found hilarious. Um, they think if there's a gold fringe flag in a courtroom, it means that's a corporate courtroom. It's not a legitimate judge or courtroom. That's a sign of the corporation. So that feeds their paranoia. They, they, it legitimizes them. And there's other things like that. I can't think of too many of them right now that they have. Uh, one of the funny things is, you know, you, in a courtroom, you have the well of a courtroom, the attorney's tables, you know, uh, the judge's stand, and then you'll have, you know, the gallery. They believe if they step into the, some of them, if they step into the well of the courtroom, that's a barrier. It's like an invisible barrier. Once you've stepped into that area, you've exceeded jurisdiction to the court. You've given them jurisdiction. So there's videos of sovereign citizens litigating their case, standing right behind you know, the line where they would enter into the courtroom. They'll just stand there and argue and argue. and. So the judge is like, come forward so I can hear you. And I'm not coming in there, judge. You're trying to trick me, right? That's part of their paranoia. You're trying to trick me, and then you get jurisdiction over me. So 
Uh, state citizenship, I talked about that before. The, the, pro the reason that doesn't work, though, is because they also will not follow the state laws. So, and some of them will argue, well, uh, you know, I'm a state citizen. The, the federal laws don't apply to me. Well, the state laws do. Uh, well, no, those don't apply yet. Okay. Um, another interesting thing that I've seen a lot of recently, and these are, these are oftentimes with these squatters, this, this usually makes the news. So you can find this a, fairly frequently if you just Google sovereign citizens. They will go into abandoned houses and claim them as their own. And I'm sure we all know what legal theory, you know, probably one of our favorites from law school, adverse possession. So they will go into a house, they'll sit in there for a couple of weeks, the police will come to remove them, they will say adverse possession, nobody claimed this building, this house, it's mine. Um, this is fairly frequent. One of the more disturbing trends that I've seen recently is they will go into like either newly listed houses or houses that have been sold but have not yet, uh, you know, the, the buyer hasn't taken possession. So there's videos of them breaking into million dollar houses and they literally will start to like set up, like they'll, they'll live there, they will live in the houses. And the police have to come and there's always some sort of standoff, you don't have jurisdiction over me, you work for the corporation, um, they, you know, and the police have to go in oftentimes and get them. These are some taglines and common words. I went over a lot of these. Um, I am not a name. I don't have a name. I don't answer in questions. The policy enforcers are going to learn today. Um, they, they sometimes call the police policy enforcers because they don't believe the laws the police are enforcing are legitimate. They'll say, you're enforcing a policy, not a law. Therefore, I don't have to listen to you. Uh, it's legal, but it's not lawful. Again, the word games that they use. Uh, there's, I have like five page of the, pages of this in the book. So. Okay, the psychology of sovereign citizens by a non-psychologist. And... Here we have a, a, a psychiatrist or psychologist talking to the sovereign citizen. He doesn't understand what's happening, and she is like, oh, crap. Well, yeah, let me get into that. So I, in the book, I basically, again, I'm totally not a psychologist, but I see sort of four trends with the sovereign citizens. Number one, there are the true believers. And maybe someone like the guy we saw at the beginning, probably William P. Gale. There's other ones who are famous because they've gone to court so many times. That's another thing. They like to play attorney. So, and they will take money from people and go into court, pretend to be a lawyer. Um, a lot of those ones are like true believers or they're schemers. But... Um, some of them, so there are ones out there who really deeply hold this ideology, and as you'll see, in my opinion, those are the ones that become violent and get really scary. Um, then you have what I call the leaners and schemers. So there are people who get into this just to take advantage of other people. Like I said, they play lawyer. They sell fake legal documents online. Um, they sell fake subscriptions online. There was a guy in Hawaii, he called himself a private attorney general. He set up a law office. He had three or four or five people working for him. I can't remember exactly what he was doing. It was like real estate transactions. He was just saying, I'm going to be a lawyer. Only he was never completing the transactions. He was just literally just taking people's money and like sending them fake documents. Um, he represented himself in federal court and the trial, there's some journalists wrote an incredible article on the trial, it's really interesting and entertaining. Um, and he, you know, he obviously lost and got like a pretty hefty uh, prison sentence if I recall, like 10, 15 years. Um, and that's not too uncommon. 
because you'll see in, they often end up in federal court, though of course they're in state court as well. Um, but a lot of the stuff I see online, like these, the federal court judges usually hit them pretty hard once they lose because they're denying responsibility. They show no remorse. They deny the legitimacy of the court overall. They say, you know, extreme things in court. So um, those are the leaners and the schemers. Then you have the marks who are the people who get taken advantage of by these leaners and schemers. Um, those are sort of the ones who are uh, creatures of opportunity or bad luck, I guess. Um, well, I kind of put the mark, in, in my book I call the marks and the down and outers. Maybe they're the same, but the marks are the ones who the sovereign citizens who are really trying to make money and scheme people take advantage of. Like the private attorney general who had four people working for him. They prosecuted one or two of those people, but they didn't prosecute all of them because some of them like legitimately had, it seemed that they had no idea that what they were doing was illegal. They thought they were working for a lawyer. So then you have the, um, the down and outers. So, you know, I mentioned that previously. People have had their license, you know, their license is so suspended, they're never gonna get it back. So they find this online, and now they have a reason to drive. Um, also, defendants and perhaps you know the criminal attorneys in this room and judges have seen this. Um, when they're in really bad circumstances, like you know, been convicted for homicide or, or, or something, they're they're facing 20, 30, 40 years in prison. They suddenly become sovereign citizens. Uh, the, the ideology spreads in prisons and in jails. Um, I guess it's a ray of hope for some of them. It's, it's kind of sad, um, but they will adopt it and then they will go into court at their sentencing, start claiming all of these things. So uh, you see it in all kinds of circumstances. Some people, it comes to them. Some people, uh, it goes to that. It goes, or I'm sorry, they, they go out and they find it. Um, one of the more interesting ones, perhaps some, some of you know of this one, uh, Wesley Snipes, when he was prosecuted for tax evasion, he went to court and, and, and used several sovereign citizen arguments um, to try to help himself out. Uh, pretty sure he was convicted and he did prison time. You know, who knows, that may have contributed. I mean, if I can say anything is, it, does, it, it will not help the jail sentence. It will not help the jail sentence. Um, okay. So that's, that's my take on the psychology of sovereign citizens. This one here, sovereign citizens as criminals, miscreants, and terrorists, uh, why should we care? A um, Couple of examples, it, it, you know, they, there's a term, it's called paper terrorism. So they, they will get involved in the judicial system and they will file liens against judges. They'll file liens against attorneys. Uh, they will go after them through a form of paper terrorism. Something else that, again, judges generally have absolutely no patience for, cost tons of money for the court system, um, and it's really a big nuisance. So that's one reason to care, th th this paper terrorism. Um, you know, another reason is they delegitimize the, the, the court system, the government itself. That can be disturbing. And the biggest reason is that some of them term, turn violent. Um, the scenario I told you about before uh, was luckily, you know, de-escalated. Nobody was hurt. There are multiple uh, accounts of sovereign citizens killing or shooting police officers. Um, it, that's mostly where you see it, you know, the, they run into law enforcement and they, they just start shooting. And then they get in the court and then you find out, boom, they're sovereign citizens. Um, that happened, there seemed to be a lot in the 90s, early 2000s. There's been some recent ones, but not too many, but some really tragic ones like, you know, two, two officers walk up to the vehicle and the two guys inside, father, son, this was in Memphis, Arkansas, just start shooting, kill the two officers. Um, the police did eventually, I think they ended up killing both of them in a high-speed chase, and the father of one of the officers, 
He was a law enforcement officer as well. He now travels the country uh, briefing law enforcement on sovereign citizens. Uh, I believe, well, I, I don't know this. I know a lot of uh, police departments will do some sort of training on sovereign citizens. I've talked to officers about it. Um, so most of them are aware of what they are. I don't know if that was the truth 10 years ago, but now they are. Well, there's my reasons right there. Paper terrorism, violent crimes, undermine civil society. Practical guide for dealing with sovereign citizens. Um, tips for judges. So in that first video, you would see Judge Hall um, deny, or I'm sorry, Judge Hurley deny him bond. At the very end, he says, he says, I'm denying the bond of the agent, the settler, and the person. <laughs> Just so Mr. Hall knew that he was going to jail. Um, you know, again, I, I, this is just from my observation, these videos and reading about them. Uh, some judges give them a lot of leeway and, you know, that tends to waste like a whole lot of time. It really depends on the matter. I mean, if they're in there for a traffic matter, what are you going to do um, if it's something more serious? Uh, but, you know, sometimes the only time they listen is when they're held in contempt of court. So at least judges have that tool. Um, I think it's a pretty good tool, tool to deal with them because usually they will, sometimes they will stop once the judge says jail, like most people. But um, that's, there are a couple of more tips that I put in, in, in my book. Uh, I'm running out of time, so I want to run through it. Tips for law enforcement. Like I said, you, wanna, you want to, um, some of the things, it's, Law enforcement, they're pretty good at it. Some of these officers, it's unbelievable. I found one of the things they do is the ones who really have a knowledge of the law can really jam these guys up because they think that they know more, even about like some of the state law. So if the officer's really savvy on the law, he can usually win. Um, they will sometimes like get a warning and then post on their website that like their arguments won, okay? Or they'll beat a case for a different reason. Like, they'll be offered a deal or something or whatever, pay the fine. And then they'll go online and claim that the sovereign citizen arguments won the case. So it just makes things worse. This is my favorite, tips for lawyers. So the one, the one anecdote that I read was from a public defender. And this is actually when I first encountered them eight or nine years ago. I was interning at the public defender's office and a sovereign citizen was being brought up. This was in Allegheny County. And everybody in the courtroom was like, oh, we got a sovereign citizen coming up, you know, the sheriff and, and sheriff's deputies. And they came in and just, I, I was like blown away. Um, but it, it also kind of piqued my curiosity. I, I like constitutional law. You know, what exactly are they yapping about? So that, that's when I first heard of them. This one, um, this one uh, public defender wrote online in a thread, he, an encounter he had with a sovereign citizen. And the sovereign was all, making all the arguments to the public defender, and the public defender said, look, I think this is maybe the best argument so if you're dealing with them, at, well, from a defense attorney perspective. But as he says, look, maybe you're right, okay? Let's even say you are right. But that judge right there is the leader of an army of armed deputies with guns. So you're going to lose. You know, you can go in there and say whatever you want. And even if you are right, they have the guns. And he claims in his post that that at least got the sovereign citizen to stop talking and let him do his job when he went into the courtroom. Um, you know, for pri like public defenders, they will try, well, this happens in general for criminal defense attorneys, but they will try to get the public defender to make their arguments, you know, put this argument forward, say this to the judge, and especially for PD, I mean, as a private attorney, I can just say, see you later for the most part. Uh, they probably wouldn't hire me anyway. They think attorneys are agents of the corporation, or part of the theory, you'll hear this, agents of the crown. So some of them believe the United States is still beholden to the king of England. And they are agents of the crown. It's another little trinket in the theory. 
Um, but they really don't. They really don't like attorneys, judges, or police officers. Uh, future of the movement, you know, I personally believe that like no tolerance is really the only way to deal with these people. You know, I hope things like, you know, the book that I put out. There's actually, funny enough, um, a psychiatrist. Sh she's in Pittsburgh, and she wrote a. Um, you know, a formal textbook on the psychology of sovereign citizens. I haven't read it yet. Uh, it's available on Amazon. Um, and she studied them. She studies conspiracy movements generally. And so she wrote this book on them. And, you know, putting things, like countering these ideas, I think, is the best way to go. Um, another touch on syncretism is they with that sovereign citizenship will combine with all kinds of different conspiracy theories. So, you know, the Illuminati, uh, you know, JFK's assassination, you're gonna see it, it will combine with all types. So pretty much any conspiracy theory out there, they you will see it, the sovereign citizen language sometimes mixed in with it. Um, that's why she studied it. But, you know, my book is sort of a comical take on it, and hers is like a really good uh, educational text on it. Um, you can contact me if you want to check it out. But if you, if you go on Amazon, you'll find my book and her book, like, right up there. She's in Pittsburgh, too. Not that we have, like, an overwhelming amount of them, but um, is it growing? I said before, uh, social media, YouTube, conspiracy theories generally, I think it is, mainly because of the Internet. And that's just an image there, no country for sovereign citizens. Um, I'll, I'll, end, I'll end with a little bit of hope. Um, there was an instance of a federal public defender who was representing a sovereign citizen. And I can't remember, if he, I think he was in bond or he had already been convicted and was awaiting sentencing. And the public defender took a liking to this guy, spent a lot of time with him regardless in, in the prison, in the jail. And started giving him books like on United States history, on constitutional history, uh, law books. And I guess because he's in jail, he has nothing else to do, he read all these books. And this was in an article, a journalist wrote this article. Um, and when he comes to sentencing, you know, the guy literally, he got up there, you see it happens for some of them. They'll say, yeah, when I, first came in here, Your Honor, I believed all of these things, and, you know, he said, but my attorney, he was giving me these books, I didn't know this, I didn't know that, I didn't know this, he's, you know, he renounced the sovereign citizen ideology, and, you know, maybe it was just out of self-interest, he did get a better sentence, but if you read that article, it sounded pretty genuine, so... That's why I think, personally, the cure to sovereign citizenship is books or just real knowledge and or real education. But, um, you know, I, I hope that everybody learns something from this. If you deal with these people now, maybe you have a better idea of exactly what you're dealing with because, you know, the first time it can be extremely confusing. And some judges will, they don't know What's, that these are sovereign citizens. And again, they'll, they'll sprinkle it in here and there. And I think a lot of, they, the judge would be better prepared if he already had an education on them. And the same is true of law enforcement and or attorneys. So I hope that uh, this helped and I hope it was a little entertaining as well. Thank you.